We know that people come into museums not in a way to escape the real world, but we know they come in to see what is good and to be ha have that sense reinforced that there is beauty, there is light, there are things that are done for, for joy. And that is really, I think, what art on one level stands for. That's Graham Beale, director and CEO of the Detroit Institute of Arts. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. This week, we mark the kickoff of the sixth season of Blue Star Museums. The NEA, Blue Star Families, and the Department of Defense joined forces with 2,000 museums across the country to offer free admission to active service members and their families throughout the summer. Since the program's beginning, the Detroit Institute of Arts has been a Blue Star Museum. Founded in 1885, the DIA's collection is among the top six in the United States, and it's long known for its collections of multicultural and multinational art. Its current show is a case in point. Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in Detroit is a spectacular look at the two Mexican artists and the time they spent in America's industrial capital. The show brings together nearly 70 works that demonstrate the evolution of these two extraordinary artists who found themselves in Detroit at different points in their careers. They came to Detroit because Diego Rivera was commissioned to create a mural for the museum, and he created a masterpiece a majestic 27-panel work known as the Detroit Industry Cycle, which served as the artist's tribute to Detroit's manufacturing base and its labor force. Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in Detroit is the brainchild of museum director Graham Beale, who was convinced that the year the artist spent in Detroit was pivotal to both their careers. And like all major exhibitions, it was a long time in the making. About 10 years ago, I thought it would be a good idea after the many decades that have passed and all of the stories, some true, some not true, that have grown up around uh, this couple, I thought it would be time to sort of, on the one hand, set the record straight, but on the other hand, present what really was uh, quite a dramatic event in the, in the uh, history of Detroit and art world. We certainly think of or associate Diego Rivera with Detroit, but Frida Kahlo less so. Why the decision to include her here? Well, uh, when she arrived here, as you say, she was completely unknown. She was referred to as Mrs. Rivera. She was asked if she was, in fact, an artist, and she responded on one occasion, yes, the greatest in the world. But uh, they were actually opposite in the sense that Rivera was at the height of his fame. Most people and he regard the Detroit industry murals as his finest mural cycle. He was fated around the world. He'd just had only the, the second one artist show at the Museum of Modern Art. The only other one was Matisse a couple of years earlier. He was gregarious and he loved being in the U.S. And Frida was exactly the opposite. She was 20 years younger. She was completely unknown. She was just finding her way as an artist. And she disliked all things Yankee, gringo, um, and she really did not like being in Detroit. She had a very uncomfortable time here socially. She uh, didn't feel that she was with the people she wanted to be with. And then she had the horrible experiences of uh, the loss of a child, loss of a, of a fetus. And her mother died, and she had to pick her way across the states back down to Mexico for her mother arriving there just very, very short few hours after her mother passed away. If it's fair to say, which I think it is, uh, Diego Rivera tended to paint quite heroic work, Frida Kahlo really painted her pain very often. What happened to her when she was a teenager? She was in a bus when it was rammed by a, a trolley, and one of the handrails of the trolley pierced her abdomen and went all the way through her abdomen, and she had broken bones, and she... She, they, she was at one moment declared dead, and uh, she was uh, 17 or 18 um, at the time. She survived, obviously, uh, but also in a way miraculously, and, and she lived with this pain and with a ruined spine for the rest of her rather short life. 
it was after that accident that she really turned to art. As far as I know, she was going to be a doctor before then, oddly enough. Yes, yes. It, what she did, she, she uh, took up drawing as part of her recovery uh, period, and then she suddenly decided that she was going to somehow get Rivera. And, and she was very bold, and she went off to show him her paintings, and, and Rivera agreed with her that she had talent and that she should pursue this. And she not only pursued her art, she pursued Diego as well. As well. And it's fair to say he was pretty happy to be pursued? I, w- I would think so, yes. I mean, he, he, he was one of the, the great womanizers of the 20th century. How did the idea of the industry mural emerge? Where did this come from? The uh, director of the DI at the time, William Valentina, a German scholar, Rembrandt scholar, but a man with wonderfully wide tastes, friends of the German expressionists, he was in uh, San Francisco uh, visiting um, H- um, Helen Wills Moody, the tennis player, who was, I think, having a fling with Rivera at that time. He met Rivera, who was painting murals in San Francisco. They're both still extant. And he invited Rivera to paint murals in the DIA in a garden court, a winter garden that, that with big blank walls that had always been intended to have some kind of mural. And uh, Valentina asked Rivera, who accepted immediately, and Valentina came back to Detroit and the great patron, Edsel Ford, immediately agreed to sponsor. And so in April of 1932, Rivera and Frida Kahlo arrived in Detroit, and he went to work. If you had to describe Diego Rivera as a painter, how would you describe him? Well, he is very definitely a realist, but everything is simplified and to some degree, and he has a, an absolutely wonderful sense of form. He just draws a single line, as it were, and you already feel the roundness of whatever it is that he's depicting. An astonishing sense of, of composition. The Rivera murals themselves are a masterpiece of clarity of design. Within that is, is complexity. So extraordinary um, natural uh, abilities and and trained in Mexico and in Europe over many years. Now, he was probably one of the most famous communist artists, and one cannot help but notice the irony of becoming the darling, at least for a while, of the Rockefellers. Yes, uh, I mean, his communism was idiosyncratic, to say the least, and he was thrown out of the party. And he initially supported Trotsky, um, and so that got him kicked out of the official Communist Party. And in fact, Frida herself got upset that he was so willing to take American money and to, to dally with, with the capitalists. And Rivera, when he came to the States, worked in Detroit and then went on to New York. He did not want to go back to Mexico, and it was a, a source of huge contention that ultimately, in, in a way, led to the breakup that uh, Frida felt she could only live in Mexico, uh, where humanity resided, and Rivera wanted all of the perks that came with being a famous artist in the U.S. Let's talk about the murals themselves. What do they depict? The two main panels, which was the original commission, depict the creation of an automobile, starting on the north wall with the smelting of the steel at the very top of the panel, and then following two miles of assembly line all the way through over to the other wall where you see the assembly of of the bodywork of the automobile around the the internal components that you'd seen on the north wall and until right out in the very middle of that panel in the far far distance is the only complete vehicle in the whole mural it's almost a where's waldo kind of experience looking for it a little red car, and I think it's significant that he painted it red. But the mural at the Detroit Institute of Arts is 27 panels. That's quite a jump from the original commission for two panels. What happened? When he showed Edsel Ford the two main panels, Edsel Ford was so pleased. We don't know how this happened, but somehow Rivera just happened to have plans for all of the other 25 panels as well. And so there and then they ne- renegotiated Rivera's contract and he he painted all of the panels. And the other panels are more symbolic, even allegorical, and they address the good and the bad of the industrial process. It's a series of oppositions, man and machine, organic, inorganic, the north and the south, the old Mexico, the new America, 
are all woven into this. And, and to me, the intellectual achievement of what Rivera himself, he had no help, he did it all himself. The intellectual achievement is equal to that of the artistic achievement. You have a catalog that goes with the exhibit, and I'm looking at it even as we speak, and it, it really is a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. But mm -hmm. I, it really is impossible to understand the sense, the capacity of him as an artist without actually being at that museum and looking at those murals. Yes, yes. I mean, people do gasp when they walk into the room for the first time. And we made the decision. At one time, we thought that because Rivera was so important in the U.S. in the 1930s, at one point, we felt the exhibition, at one point, the exhibition sort of um, moved into being much more about Rivera. Uh, but in the end, I made the decision that this was a human interest story, not a, not a cultural interest history story. And so... Uh, we uh, went back to the original idea. Say what you mean, a human interest story, not a cultural interest story. Well, when you start talking about uh, Rivera and his influence on the American mural, the w WPA artists, mm -hmm. artists like Jackson Pollock and those, are, you start talking about style and about artistic influence, um, and it becomes much more of an intellectual exercise. When you just focus um, on the rich tapestry of the 11 months that, uh, that Rivera and Carlo spent here, it is very much a human interest story. There is the style, there is the art, the difference in style and the art and the way Frida developed, but it is really about two human beings who felt passionately about one another, who felt passionately about art, who believed that art and life were not separate, that they were inextricable. And all of those things come together in this, from, our, from Detroit's point of view, in this sort of 11-month focal point. I just want to go back to the murals for one moment. What technique did he use? He used pure, true fresco. When the Mexican Revolution had established itself, it wanted to um, have the equivalent of the medieval stained glass windows, which was a people's Bible. It wanted to have works that proclaimed the glory of the Mexican Revolution. And Rivera uh, was paid for two years to work in Italy and learn the true fresco technique, which he brought back with him. And it entails, in the end, after a lot of preparatory work, it entails painting into a thin layer of wet plaster. And you can only do as much as the plaster stays dry for the day. It's called giornata. It's called a day's work in, in Italian. And that's the technique that he used here and elsewhere. And it's not exactly indestructible, uh, but it's impervious to light. When the Rockefellers dismissed Rivera for his audacity, they had to jackhammer it off the walls. You could paint over it, but it, it would still be there. We're talking so about New York now when he went to New York. It, yes, after Detroit. He got away with a few jabs at capitalism here, but good-natured in overall. But he just went overboard when he was in Rock the Rockefeller Center. And usually the Lenin is cited as the official reason that they dismissed him. But showing John D. Rockefeller, who was something of a teetotaler, I think, Holding a martini glass surrounded by chorus girls is not a way to endear yourself to your patrons. And at that period of time, Frida Kahlo is, I don't want to say coming into her own as a painter, but really developing a style as a painter. No, oh, I, I think you're right. She did a couple of, a few paintings before she came here. And you can see that Frida is there, a portrait that she did, uh, for example. It, it has wonderful attributes in it. But it really is in Detroit with the, the Henry Ford Hospital, the incident that because of the miscarriage, that she followed up on, on what was actually Rivera's advice. Her husband's advice was make yourself the center of your art. And as you said, the Frida Kahlo that arrives here is really unrecognizable. And the one that leaves here, you can't mistake any of her paintings for anything other than the Frida Kahlo that we know today. Please describe her painting, Henry Ford Hospital. It uh, shows a, a naked Frida Kahlo on a bed at, a, at an angle, a strange angle um, that doesn't quite coincide with the ground. And the ground itself is a very, very bleak industrial landscape with what is obviously a shorthand version of the Rouge River Ford plant in the background. And on the bed, the bedstead written the words, Henry Ford Hospital. Blood is coming from the area of her 
her pelvis onto the onto the sheets of the bed, and attached by long red sort of umbilical lines are uh, half a dozen objects. There's a, a car engine. There's a snail. There's an actual fetus. There's a body made of machine parts. And so it, it's a very very strange picture, and it really just just screams pain and loss. You know, and it, it's all done in the very clear, bright colors of the Mexican retablos tradition that Frida was working from. Her painting was seen as as surrealist, which was a term she really bristled at. Yes, because she did feel that it came out of her Mexican heritage. But the Surrealist movement was in full swing. André Breton, the, the Surrealist Pope, was always eager to annex good artists to his cause. And there were women artists working in Mexico at, at that time who were working fully within the framework of Surrealism. And Frida's work looked as if it fit. But as you said, it was not something that, that she personally embraced. She felt that Surrealism was an intellectual and European phenomenon, and, and she was all about Mexico. Another painting by Frida Kahlo that you have in this exhibit, which, again, one really does need to see, is A Few Small Nips, yes. which is just a vision of horror. Yes, yes. This famous episode of a man who murdered his girlfriend by stabbing her repeatedly, and then when he was arrested said, I thought it was just a few small nips. And Frida Kahlo shows the woman stabbed to death and the man standing over her with the banner saying, just in, in Spanish, a few small nips. It is a, a horrific picture. It's right up there with the kind of work that George Gross and the German Expressionists had been doing. Because she brings the painting, as she does with the Dorothy Hale painting, it moves outside the canvas itself and there's, there are blood splotches all around the frame. Yes, as if the frame itself has been stabbed, exactly. And there are, there are dents, the blood, there are the blood spots, but there are stab marks there as well. Mm. And it is felt to be somewhat autobiographical. Some think responding to the fact that she knew that Rivera was not going to be faithful to her, but he just inflicted so much pain on her. It's, it's such a powerful painting. And when did she paint that? Did she paint that in Detroit? No, that was um, painted, I think, within a year of returning to Mexico. So it is fair to say she came in not having found her style and, and left Detroit, not there yet, but nonetheless completely on the road to who she would become as an artist. Yes, uh, to all intents and purposes. Yes, it, it was, um, I've used the word chrysalis, that this is where she emerged. Certainly the painting of her Americas, her standing on in a beautiful pink dress with one foot in Mexico and one foot in the U.S. No one would fail a slide test in saying that, yes, that's by Frida Kahlo. It, she still developed as an artist. Her technique improved, but it, all of the ingredients are there, the, the very sharp focus, the bright colors, the intensely autobiographical nature of it, and the various levels of discomfort and pain that she managed to inject into so many of her pictures. It's an interesting twist of fate that right now, Frida Kahlo is the more renowned of the two artists. Yes, I mean, th that is one of the big ironies, and this is distressing to some Mexicans. One of the reasons that we got such support for the show was that there is this feeling that Rivera needs to be reestablished as Mexico's finest 20th century artist. But Rivera was the artist of, of his time, and his particular glorification of whatever ultimately is propagandist, and it was official art, it has faded a, a little bit, yeah. whereas Fr Frida is the ultimate, I, I don't know what the right word would be, but the ultimate Facebook artist. It's very, very personal. It's, it seems to be very spontaneous. And it is in its own way, although there have been some wonderful American artists who were influenced by her in the 70s and 80s, 80s her, her work is inimitable. What I, what I wrote in the sideline is I look at his work and it's clearly brilliant, but it looks like an historical artifact rather than something that speaks to us now in the present day. And Frida Kahlo's work seems very present. Yes, she is. She is an artist of our time. And, and uh, Rivera is astonishing, but in, in many ways it, it is a bit like looking up at Michelangelo's ceiling or 
at Pinterecchio's uh, nearby paintings, uh, and it needs to be decoded, it needs to be explained, because it was about something else and it was about a different time. Well, what's been the response to the show? Oh, it's been wonderful, uh, absolutely marvellous. People are lining up. We're having uh, great, great, great attendance in light of what we've just discussed. A number of people have said to me, and I know it's happened to, to others, that I haven't seen the Frida show yet. That's the name that, that catches people. That's what people want to see. That is interesting. But and are more people coming into the museum because of this show? Yes, this counts as a blockbuster. We're having tremendous attendance. Seven weeks in, we've already exceeded the attendance of the two major exhibitions that we had last year. Well, that must be wonderful for you because it's been such a challenging time for Detroit and for the Detroit Institute of Arts in particular. Yes, it has been. It has been quite a period. Although for a while this show was put on hold, um, I was determined that whatever happened, this show would, would happen even if it was the last show <laughs> But, you know, we got the tax passed, so we have financial security and we have the bankruptcy behind us. So it's a it's a tremendous celebration and it gives new meaning to Rivera's murals because you look at it now not as an elegy of a Detroit that is dead and gone, but you look at it as a sort of a almost as a symbol of what can be again. In reading the catalog, I didn't realize that when Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo came to Detroit, the city was on the verge of bankruptcy. Oh yes, no. That that was one of the reasons that some people were upset. What what's they what are they doing, bringing this foreign artist here when people can't eat and paying him lots of money to paint a picture in in the, the new temple of culture? And so so yes, I mean the, the museum uh, was was in very bad shape. It's it's not widely known, but Edsel Ford was actually paying the salaries of staff members because the city had run out of money. As I mentioned at the top of the show, the Detroit Institute of Arts is part of the Blue Star Museum program. Yes. I'm going to let you give a thumbnail sketch of that program. Every summer, uh, May to September, we are free uh, to any service members and, and their families. And we've been a part of the Blue Star program since its inception. And last year, we had 700 individuals come into the museum through the Blue Star vehicle. Why did the museum sign up? Why did it seem like that would that would be something you would do? I would love for the museum to be free to everybody, but this did did seem a way of making a a statement that this is this is in its own way about civilization. We stand for for a particular kind of of civilization. So it was a it was certainly an easy thing to do. But since then, I haven't had this passed out. But with the passage of the property tax, in exchange for that. All the inhabitants of the three counties, the tri-counties that pay the tax, get in free anyway. So the lines have become a little bit blurred because one has to assume that service people coming are likely to come from this region, if not the the three particular counties. In a broader, more philosophical way, with service members and their families, with, with Detroit that's going through hard times, art can really be very meaningful for people It's not really a luxury. No, I mean, I have to say, my father was a veteran of World War II dying, and he went to to London on the National Health Service, all paid for, and he would take my sister or me with him um, on these day trips, and we would visit free museums, and this was really something that was meaningful. And we know that people come into museums not in a way to escape the real world, but we know they come in to see what is good and to be ha- have that sense reinforced that there is beauty, there is light, there are things that are done for, for joy. And that is really, I think, what art on one level stands for. What brought you to a life in art? Uh, well, actually, as I said, my, my father was um, a wounded uh, vet, and my mother also had a little bit of an artistic background, but he took up painting uh, from his bed. And my sister and I, that was one way f- from a very early age that we would be with our father. We'd sit alongside as he painted and we would draw. My sister's just retired from being a professor of drawing at a, an English university, so it was part of our lives from, from the very, very beginning. And as I say, these trips to London just reinforced the sense that the museums were free, that they were yours, that you could just walk in. These were not places of, of privilege, that they, they were there for everybody. 
Graham, thank you so much, and I can't wait to come and see the exhibit. Great. Oh, thank you. That was Graham Beal, director and CEO of the Detroit Institute of Arts. The exhibit, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in Detroit, runs through July 12th. Find out all about it at dia.org. And to find a Blue Star Museum in your area, go to arts.gov and click on Blue Star Museums. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog. Or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.